So we're lucky enough to be here with Penny. Hello, Penny. Hi. We've got a few questions for you around change management. We're looking to help our clients and prospects understand change management better, and we think you're the very person to ask. So, <laughs> we'd like to start by finding out a little bit about you, what you've achieved, and where you are in life right now, because I think you're on garden leave. I am, just at the end of my garden leave. Okay. So a, a potted life story is I trained as a business psychologist initially in Australia, uh, but late, latterly uh, in Oxford. Mm -hmm. I spent, I've spent about 20 years consulting uh, to the HR world with a particular focus on personality and how the insights from personality can be applied to add value to organisations and the people working in them. Um, but I've always been interested in change. The very first job I did in Australia, I was in an organisation that got restructured and I saw how awful that was for people and all the collateral damage. So I decided I wanted to do something to find out how that could be done better. And that was what made me come to Oxford where I did my doctoral studies around change. Okay, fantastic. And what about right now? You're at the end of your garden leave. So where have you come from? Where are you going to? Yeah, so I've, uh, for most of my career, I've spent with a company called OPP, who are one of Europe's largest business psychology providers. Uh, possibly you may have heard of them if you've heard of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. OPP are the European distributor of that. So within OPP, I worked around various roles, consulting, training HR professionals, uh, doing research, product development, marketing, international sales, and ultimately CEO, having done pretty much every other job in the business. Uh, OPP was sold a year ago, so there was quite a lot of change that we had to work through to get to that point. Right. Um, and the new owners didn't need my services, so I've been on garden leave for a year and just ready to launch myself back into the world of work. Okay, so 12 months of doing whatever you want. Fantastic. It does sound fantastic, doesn't it? Um, sort of, I've thought of it as a sort of mid-career sabbatical. Lovely. Lovely. All right. And just while we're talking about Myers-Briggs, uh, what are your four letters? Yeah, my preferences are for ENTJ. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're exactly... The Very same. typical of a manager. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I try and always remember what the Star Wars character is for that one. I think it's... Um, no, it's gone. Padawan? I'm afraid it might be Darth Vader, but I haven't looked at it recently. <laughs> okay. All right. Fabulous. Well, we've got the same Myers-Briggs type indicators, which is, uh, well, one in 16 chance. Let's yep. move. Uh, the guys that have asked us questions through LinkedIn, Twitter, and our blog have said um, they want to know about change management. So let's find out about your credibility. What makes you an expert or someone who can talk about change management credibly? Yeah, so as I said, I um, decided very, uh, well, having qualified as a psychologist, I really wanted to know more about managing change and how to do it well and without quite so much collateral human damage. So when I came to Oxford, um, I, I conducted my doctoral research in that area, as it happens actually with a, a major retail group. So I didn't know that before I started talking to you that that was going to be so relevant. Um, I can't tell you who. Um, but it, it's a it's a household name, um, and we looked at a couple of different kinds of changes that they were implementing at the time. Yeah. We looked at the opening of new stores. This was back in the early '90s when it was quite common for uh, these uh, supermarkets to be closing down their inner city stores so they could move out to a sort of ring road large superstore. So we followed three different uh, groups through that transition over a six-month period and right. looked at what, uh, how that went for people. We also looked at the restructuring of the head office function, um, again, over a six-month period, sort of before, during and after kind of uh, surveying. Um, and the biggest finding, I guess there were two findings out of that. Mm -hmm. One was that Everybody knew that the change was somewhat stressful and, and the supermarket was very good at putting in extra resources during the opening phase. Yep. But they were quite surprised to see that the negative effects were still happening for people six months down the track. They oh. thought that everyone would be kind of over it by then. So that was a really interesting finding, so uh, partly because it went against received wisdom. So it can take over six months to get over it? 
yeah, get over it sounds a bit like you should just pull your socks up and get on with it. But yeah, but six months on, people, you know, whilst they'd settled in and they were being functional and they were doing the job well, they were still suffering from minor symptoms of anxiety, um, lower job satisfaction, uh, little somatic illnesses, as we call it. So, you know, coughs, colds, sniffles, that lowered immune system yep. stuff that happens yep. in stress. So, so we're talking about that kind of, on average, everybody suffering just a bit. We're not talking about the sort of dramatic kinds of uh, mental health issues, but just everybody kind of feeling that pressure. Okay, okay. So, okay, I would say there was, then there was another finding, which I think was the more positive one, which is the people who didn't suffer the negative effects mm -hmm. were the people who said they had strong social support, particularly from their manager and a feeling of control over their work environment. Ah, okay. So that then took me into, uh, I guess, the next stage of my career, which was trying to help managers be more supportive and provide control for their people so that no matter what is thrown at people at work, um, they can sort of ride those bumps and waves without these negative consequences. And possibly obvious, but just could you give us a practical example of manager support because it can encompass so many. Yeah, so really defining that. I think the, the two things that people tend to look for when they're talking about manager support is they want their manager to be competent. They want to feel they're working for someone who is you know, decent at their job. Yep. And they want their manager to pay attention to them as an individual, to what's going on for them. Is it working? Is it not working? what their career aspirations might be, how that fits in with whatever's going on at work. But if a manager can just kind of sort of do two things to be a good manager, they do need to be technically good at their job, yep. but they actually also need to care about the people that they're working with and demonstrate that care. Okay, okay. And largely, I guess that can come in the form of just giving someone some time to start with and then listening to them would be the very... Yeah. yeah, and because of my kind of Myers-Briggs background, one of the things we would add into that is remembering that um, although we are used, most people are very well intended and as an ENTJ, I would generally expect other people to want things that I want, but learning that there are 15 other ways of being mm -hmm. helps me realize I'm gonna get, if I just give out what I would want, yeah. I will get that wrong for most people. Right. So right. understanding kind of that different people are different, people respond to stress differently, people look for different things, people find different kinds of things stressful. So being able to really individuate that. Very true, very true. If I draw on my own experience, I was at a big retailer and in the 13 years I was there at head office, I reapplied for my own job eight times. Yeah, not nice. No, it's not nice. And I remember the times that were good and that's where my manager seemed to care. Hmm. Gave me some time, took me out for a beer. Yeah, exactly. Having a manager who just kind of offers you that empathy of yeah, you know, this is this is not a great process, but we're going to make it fair. We're going to work through it together. And half the challenge okay. seems to be understanding what the rules are. If you understand the rules, people seem to take it a lot better. But Yeah, and that, that speaks to the control part. You know, having some clarity about what the rules are helps you feel you're in control. If it's all just a complete mystery, there's no way you can feel in control of it. That's true, that's true. Okay, all right, thank you. So in layman's terms, what is change management? because there's a lot of people talking about change management and there's a lot of books about it, but really, what is it? <laughs> God, uh, yeah, I, I, I puzzle over this question. <laughs> to me, and this may not neatly answer your question, I think it's the, the piece of the puzzle that enables your strategy to be realized. It's that bit in between the, we've had a great vision, yep. we know what it is we want the company to do, um, and that actually happening. The, the bits that make, turn that into reality, our change management. So there's, okay. you know, articulating the strategy, com communicating it to, to everybody, but really engaging them in it so they can deliver it. All right, so if I, if I was uh, at your company, OPP, as you went through quite a lot yep. of changes, what sort of things would I see where I might say, ah, we're doing this change management thing? Yeah, so when, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a good one. When we were, coming out of the recession from 2009 or so i think was our kind of worst year with that yeah. in the initial part we did there was a lot of um 
belt tightening and, and all the sort of nasty parts of having to cut back and, and all those things, which I, I know nearly everybody lived through that uh, in one way or another. But the, and we did change management around that, but the bit that was, I guess, more exciting and the bit that I was more responsible for was by the time we got to 2010, people were feeling quite punch drunk and, and, and tense. And we really had to then work out how were we going to go forward? And we didn't want to go forward just kind of in a bare knuckle <laughs> ride. We wanted yeah. to go forward in a sort of, you know, happy, positive frame. So we talked, there was a lot of talk about we needed to have a more commercial culture. Okay. And so then it was, well, what do we mean by a commercial culture? Because mostly it felt like it was an insult that was thrown around by the sales guys at the rest of us. Um, <laughs> you guys aren't commercial. Yeah. Um, so we did some we, so we did some workshops to work out what different people thought was part of being commercial and we came up with a, a sort of a definition for us as a business which we put into a word cloud so we had some words were bigger some words were smaller we didn't try and craft it into a paragraph but we did want to make it so it represented everything that everybody had said and thought and that we'd sort of debated and agreed upon. So these word clouds then kind of took on a life of their own. Different teams then kind of adapted them to say, well, within our team, we think it's more this and more that. So that was part of it. So it was just engaging people in what are the behaviours we think need to be commercial. But that went alongside putting in systems and processes, working out how we were going to do business planning differently so that we would invest in some future uh, possibly slightly risky uh, things that we might do, but not so much that we'd have go backwards again, but enough that we might have a chance of coming out of the hole. So we uh, had some processes around how we would filter the very many good ideas that came forward from people into the ones we would actually put money behind so that we would deliver those. And we had quite um, strong project management processes around all of that. Yep. So the processes side sounds a bit dull. Um, so, but they're important, they're solid. So engaging people in the idea that those are important and why they're important and how that does speak to this commerciality thing that we'd all agreed was a good thing for us to do. So those sorts of things happened. Um, but alongside that, we had different communication strategies. Uh, communication, whenever I say communication, I'm actually talking about a two-way process. So it's not about me as CEO standing on the parapet and saying, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's kind of make form listening as well. And it's not just me, it's the management team. So it's in your small teams, in your different teams, uh, making sure the communication is flowing around, but also with some party pieces that was our whole company presentations. We introduced a collective coffee time once a week to get people away from their desks into other departments talking to each other. Sometimes those would be places announcements happen. Sometimes they would just be, uh, you know, a social interaction. We did, uh, we had a particular project that had stalled that we needed to kill. And we did that uh, ceremonially with a pinata. <laughs> so there were all kinds of things that went on. Say yep. some of them terribly worthy and important and like business planning and budgeting and all those things helping people engage in their importance and then kind of on the side doing some things that just showed we weren't going to take life so incredibly seriously all the time. But so for us, so for me, all of that is change management. It's getting us from this batten down the hatches place yep. to becoming a, a really nicely profitable business because we weren't very profitable when we were battening down the hatches. So coming out of that in terms of what the shareholders could see, um, but also coming out of that for what employees felt like it was to be at work every day. Yep. Um, and also uh, from our customers' perspectives, people over that period would have started to see new products and services coming out that were perhaps a little different to what they'd seen from us in the past because we were backing some innovation. Okay. Okay. So if I'm uh, part of this change management thing that's going on, I might be seeing some yeah. workshops. I might be asked my views on some stuff. There'll be some new ideas, maybe some new ways of working, some new processes. Yeah. All that stuff's going on around me and with me. Yeah. And I think everyone needs to be part of it. If it's a big organisation wide change, everyone needs to understand what is it that I need to do 
that's going to be different. And it's a big jigsaw puzzle, but everyone plays a part. And what's my part of that jigsaw puzzle was my yeah. key. Right, gotcha, gotcha. Fantastic. And if I'm a, a HR manager, why do I need to know about this stuff? What about if I just listen? Yeah. yeah, change management's all about people, isn't it? Um, and and I, that's, well, I know that. You probably know that. All the HR people probably know that. Some business leaders don't quite recognise that. So I was talking to a business leader a few weeks ago um, who has been in the throes of an acquisition. And I was saying, well, how's that integration going with the acquisition? And he told me all about the IT systems, all about how the IT was integrating just beautifully. Ouch. Um, and I said, and how about the people? <laughs> and, and he sort of looked at his boots um, figuratively. And he goes, oh, yeah, they're all fine. Um, <laughs> and, and, of course, you know, you often will read in the HR press, in fact, in the general business press, that, you know, most change initiatives fail to deliver their value. Why do they fail to deliver their value? Because the people initiating the change don't understand that it's all the people who need to be part of that. So that's why HR needs to, to play a role. I think the piece for HR to be careful of is that sometimes the sort of senior leadership will say, HR, can you just fix the people side, please? Right. Um, yes. and, and that seems to me to be not a great way to make it work. Um, that's, putting, that's just dumping on HR. Application, definitely. Well, so one of the stats that we found was the University of Villanova in Pennsylvania. So I hadn't heard okay. of it before, but they did uh, quite a wide piece of research which talks about global HR challenges. And it said that the biggest challenge was change management, followed by yeah. leadership development. So 48% was the uh, challenges uh, that HR managers said should be change management. Yeah. They were most scared of. So that leads us on to what role should HR managers play in change management? We know it's not just accept being dumped on and try and get on with it. What should they do? Yeah, so I think they need to, to cozy up with their business leaders, whether that's as a partnership or however it's set up within their organisation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because HR managers can be really helpful in sort of facilitating and supporting change management. But the most effective way of doing that is to be getting the, the business leaders across the business to be doing, for example, all the communication, um, to be doing the listening as well as the outbound communication, um, to understand there's no such thing as doing too much of that. Uh, but it needs to be, you know, as I say, HR can set up the meetings and do the logistics for it and they can help prime the leaders to say the right messages. And of course they can reinforce those messages but they do need to persuade, ideally, the CEO um, and then whatever senior management there might be around to be doing that, the top down stuff and for them to be listening when the bottom up stuff comes back yes. and then yes. say, yes, I have heard that people are worried about this. So here's what we're doing about that. Um, so to really be HR to be making sure that, that that communication goes up the tree and back down again and out to the sides. So HR needs to kind of, help orchestrate that, yep. okay. that but, but the worry is that business leaders will sometimes just say well HR you do that you go to all the team meetings you tell them all what's going on and I've given you the brief yeah. off you go Not on with it. and that just, that just doesn't come off well it just looks like abdication I think was the word you used earlier and, and I guess there's a is there a part to play for HR managers and the HR function to educate the leaders if they're not getting what this change management stuff should look like yeah, so if I was um, yeah, if I was within a business and I was thinking, you know, and the HR manager was saying to me, look, these guys just don't get it, that'd be the place you'd start. So really starting with your, your top team, whatever that might be called, but your executive group, to somehow get them to take on board that it is their vision we are all trying to realise and they need to be part of that plan and respecting that they are, of course, terribly busy. But... Um, you know, they're going to find themselves busier if the change doesn't take the way they want it to. So, you know, it's that invest the time early. And sometimes it is, and this can be difficult for some managers to take on board, but sometimes the sort of the, the quickest distance between two points is not just a straight line. You know, get on with it and go is a very tempting thing to say, especially if you've spent months developing the strategy. 
because yeah. you've had a long time to think about it. You're really bought into it. And yeah. now it just seems like, well, simple, off you go. But recognising that actually everyone else hasn't had all that time with that strategy. They may have some different ideas. Their different ideas possibly could be incorporated into the strategy or you need to persuade them that although their ideas are good, that's not what you're going to do. And that, that, that takes some time and attention. And it's not that people will deliberately sabotage the change. Um, very occasionally that can happen, but most people don't come to work wanting to do that. No. They come to work wanting to do their best. And it's that aligning thing that you need to do to say, this is the way we're going. Um, and this is why, and help people kind of debate and argue about the edges of that, if that's what they need to do, um, or understand the detail of it, of it, if that's what they need, or whatever it is they might need, but they need to have that space doing it. Just telling people to get on with it rarely, rarely works. And, and maybe as an observer, someone external to some of the big brands that we've seen, have you got any examples of where you think a big brand's done it well or not done it well? I, I really, just, when we I'm really, I'm not sure I can qualify qualified to comment on on companies I haven't been a part of, and ones that I've consulted to, I'm bound by confidentiality. No, of course, no, no, no. I was just thinking about <coughs> some of the government ones like British Rail over the years, um, who seem to have done it so badly. But just a thought. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I think you can probably pick on every government department and probably every every rail group. Um, <laughs> if you're at a commute, you can certainly you as a consumer you feel the impact of when that goes wrong, yeah. and and you may feel a lot of sympathy for the poor employees who are there have just having to apologise to you because of whatever um, you know hasn't been delivered that should have been. Um, but I'm also equally sure that within those organisations, some stuff has been done right. Um, oh. Harder to see if you're not part of it. Of course, of course. All right. Well, let's ask, you gave us an example of, from yourself earlier of a company that went through change management. You were part of that. You led that. Um, yeah. Why do companies go through change management, apart from maybe cost cutting or apart from wanting to become more commercial? What other examples, reasons are there? Oh, introducing a new product to the market or a new service or a new way of doing things. Uh, introducing a new computer system. Uh, you know, we had a huge change process when we had a new, what are they called? E ERP, Enterprise. Oh, anyway, it was a big IT system that did all the finances and taking orders and all of that kind of stuff. And the, you know, implementing something like that it's not just a matter of you turn your computer on one morning and it's all there for you. Yes. It, it, it always changes how you work. So companies can't really stand still. For very brief periods of time, you might have more stable period. Mm -hmm. but, but there's always, whether it's new technology or the need to do uh, upgrade your, your services or, you know, there can be those sort of things like downsizing or growing, um, opening new offices it would be another piece of change management in the same way that the work I did with the supermarket years ago, they were opening new branches. That was change management. Yeah. So there's always something that's happening. You know, as I say, organisations are rarely sitting still. Mergers and acquisitions are another. Yeah. Demerging. Um, so anytime there's something that, that needs to be changed, that change needs to be managed. Um, um, and in many companies, go on. Go on, go on. Sorry, go on. So many companies are now talk about, you know, change is the norm. Yes. Um, yes. And companies that do that well, it really is the norm and they constantly have people who have been processes for doing that change. Some companies sometimes say that as a, almost a way of getting out of doing any change management. Well, change is the norm, so we don't need anything special for that. <laughs> and, you know, when I meet people like that, I say, well, how's it going? And, <laughs> and sometimes they are doing it well. And that's fine. They don't need my help. They don't need to hear anything from me. Yeah. Um, but when they say, you know, we, we've got it, we're all fine. We don't need the likes of you interfering. And just getting them to talk a bit longer to hear really how well is it going gives you a very good feel of whether they could be trying something different. And, and when do you recognise when it's significant change? Is there a key trigger? Is it we should look for a big product or a big change or how do you know? How do you know it's not just something small that's just changing and it'll be fine? Um, I think that's where the communication happens. Great. So if you say, you know, we're going to move from A to B, 
and everyone says, and you ask what people think and they all go, yeah, that's fine. I can take that in my stride and there's nothing, nothing to do here. Then, you know, you're kind of okay, but you've given them that opportunity. Yep, sure. When you say we're going to go from A to B, what do you think of that? And people start saying, well, is my job still going to exist? Um, will I lose my, my, my window desk that I've really loved? Um, then, then you know you've got something on. And I, I mentioned the thing about where people sit. Because that became a, a watchword for me, not only within OPP, but with some organisations I've worked with, is that the, the senior management nearly always think no one's going to care about that. No one cares where they sit. And, and everyone cares about where they sit. They care if they're going to be still sitting near their friend or they're going to have to sit next to the guy that nobody likes or... They say if they get the view of the window or if they're near the loose or all of that stuff matters to people. Sorry, um, it is. And, and giving people the chance to articulate that will give you a really clear idea of whether they're worried or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true when uh, in that retailer I mentioned earlier, we changed offices and I had one of those corner desks where everyone from the whole floor went past my desk. And they yeah. thought it was polite not to say hello. So 600 hellos a day, <laughs> you wanted to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, I won't say a desk like that. <laughs> They're not fun. They're not fun. It's like, look, I'm fine. I don't need you to say hello. Just go on by. Okay. Yeah. Come back. You've mentioned a couple of the main hurdles. We talked about needing manager support because of stress, and it can go on more than six months. What yeah. are the main hurdles to change management beyond, let's say, stress and needing manager support? Um, this sort of comes into, I know we've talked a bit about models, yes. um, but for me, there's the communication, which I've, I've mentioned before, and I think there's the uh, top down, always remember to tell you the what, it's working out the how, and engaging people in the how um, is, is a, a typical hurdle. Um, but the, another one that people ne will quite often forget is that you need a chance to let go of whatever you're leaving behind in the change. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're changing to, I don't know, yeah, moving, moving offices, and it might be a wholly positive move that, the, the, you know, generally the office is, you know, when you move office, you're moving to a newer one or a cleaner one or a bigger one or whatever. Um, but there's still a sort of saying goodbye to the old place. Well, you may have had some good times. You may have had some bad times. There might be some bad luggage you want to leave behind. Mm -hmm. But there might be some good things that uh, maybe camaraderie that you want to make sure doesn't disappear when you move on. And actually giving people some space to talk about that, to talk about what we're taking with us, um, which might be, uh, you know, physical stuff if it's an office move. You know, I really liked this chair. <laughs> Will the new chairs be as comfortable? Or it might be, you know, more metaphoric stuff like, well, this is the place where we started the company and, you know, it's got all of that cosy feeling about it. Yep. And I know it's going to have a new shiny kitchen in the other place, but will we have somewhere the same that we can sit and chat? And it's those sorts of things. So there's a sort of, there's always a letting go period of working out what it is you're leaving behind. Um, and that tends, that's the thing that's most often overlooked. Um, and again, it, it might be that people don't think there's anything significant there, but you find that out by asking. Okay. You make that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and sometimes having symbolic goodbyes are helpful. So, um, you know, it, moving offices, it might be you have a, an office party to open the new office, but actually having your final farewell of the one you're leaving can also be helpful. Like a I guess um, that's not an area that I'm expert in. I've never heard of them, but I've heard. Of them. Okay. <laughs> um, but it is that idea. I think I was going to say more like a, a funeral, but you know, there's the nicer bit afterwards. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, there is that that thing of you know, it merges and acquisitions. You know, the company being acquired, there's a there's an ending of something. Yeah. Even though the joining with something else might be the really big and exciting, but there's still an ending. And it's still just worth taking a moment to pause and say, yeah, you know, we've got a good legacy from this. And the work that we did up until now that's taking us forward, that's really worth acknowledging before you get sort of subsumed into 
whatever the new environment is. And, and just bring to life for us, would you, the, it seems like the manager gets the team together and says, look, let's debate this, let's discuss this for a bit. Is that how they get through this stuff or are there other ways? At a very high level, I think that is the way they get through this stuff. Um, exactly what the stuff is will depend on what the team what says. Yeah. Um, there's a, a whole lot of stuff that I've done around social support about looking for people's different stress triggers. So within a team, being aware of what, uh, you know, what Darren looks like when he's at his best, what he looks like when he's a bit busy and what he looks like when he's gone completely over the top. If I was working with you regularly, I would hope I would be looking out for those things and could therefore offer you the sort of support you might need if I noticed you going close to the edge mm -hmm. uh, and doing that within a team. And, you know, and some teams do that naturally and some teams need a bit of a help to figure it out. Okay. All right, uh, let's talk uh, particularly appealing to, let's say, our theorist learner. So a bunch of people who need to go through that moment of understanding a model. So what's a yeah. management model? What's your favourite? So my favourite is the model by William Bridges. Okay. Um, I think his book's called Managing Transitions. Okay. And he makes the distinction between a change, which is the top down, this is what's happening. So for example, you know, we're being acquired. That's a change. It happens legally at a particular hour on a particular day. But the transition is the emotional journey or the psychological journey for the people involved. Oh, okay. And that rarely happens quickly. And that's the piece that involves this sort of letting go of the old. Yeah. He then says there's a, a, the second stage is actually what he calls the neutral zone where you're kind of working out what the new world order is going to be. Yeah. And that's a quite scary place because we talked before about control and certainty and the neutral zone doesn't have any of that. Ah, <laughs> so right, gotcha. it's where yeah. All those questions will come up yeah. about you know, where am I going to sit and when will I know and is my job going to change and whatever else it might be. But that's your neutral zone. And then the third stage in, in his model is uh, new beginnings. So that's as you start really, and if we think of the sort of acquisition thing that I was just talking through, that's when you start actually saying, we, meaning the bigger company, and you remember to use the new company name and those sorts of things. So those are some of the little, and you're nodding wisely there because you recognize that that's what happens when people, you know, when a company is acquired or when yeah. you leave a company and you, you keep saying, we do this and we do that, and you go, oh no, actually I don't work there anymore. Yes. So that's that sort of evidence of that that transition hasn't quite happened yet, or the change might have happened. You might have left employment at a particular place, but you're still talking about it like you're part of it because you haven't actually done your endings and proper psychological goodbyes. So, so I say bridge model. Just I think it's an analogy, but it really helps capture uh, this is what goes on. And for me, what Bridges does beautifully is normalizes that for people. So instead of everyone thinking, oh God, I just can't get with the program to actually say, no, this is normal. You know, people are going to feel like this. And the recommendation is, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about how it is. Let's get those questions out. Let's bump them up the, up the tree if we need an answer from above, or let's take charge of the bits that actually are within our own authority so that there's some things that we can be more clear about, but let's kind of get that out on the table. And that's what a manager can help do is kind of help people navigate that neutral zone. Um, uh, and as I say, it's really having that space. So and as I, say, I like Bridges model because it, it, it makes you feel like I thought I was going mad, but actually it's okay because it's really normal to respond like this. Okay, so it's acceptable to do these things around here. Most of us are feeling this way type. Okay, I've got that. That's yeah, good. and bringing it out from under the table. I really like that neutral zone bit. So I've only heard of Lewin's model, which I don't know much about. Um, yeah, similar model, older. Right. Um, Kurt Levine's from the 1950s. So he talked about unfreezing that was and then refreezing. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, so in his model, it's very much the same kind of three-stage process. Yeah. Um, but he, he uses the analogy of, of water and saying you start with a steady state that might be a frozen, I don't know, square of ice, and then you have to unfreeze it, which is a bit like Bridges' neutral zone. 
So if you think of your water being all liquid and running around and no one really knows what shape it is, could become any. And then uh, you stick it in a new container, freeze it again, and you've got your, your post-change new steady state. The later thinking kind of says, well, organisations are never that steady. <laughs> you know, so it's never fully frozen when it was frozen, and it's never, ever fully frozen again. So bridge is just, I think, for me, it's like it rounds out the edges of that and says, you know, it's not as neat as freezing water. Yeah. <laughs> like a block of ice that turns into water that turns into another block of ice. Um, but it's, an, it's a good enough analogy. And I think the way people use Levine's model these days kind of has let go of the rigidity of it, but still yeah. just, you know, uses it as an analogy. Yeah, it's still a good way of understanding it. There's so many models that came out of 1950s. They all seem to, anyway, be born in that time. I don't know what happened. I think it's when people got interested in, in the science of management as organisations were getting bigger. Coming out of post-war, a few years later. Yeah. What could we learn from the organisations that ran the war? This Kirkpatrick yeah. model of um, evaluating training. Yeah. About the yeah. same theory, you think, hmm, they're all getting, conspiring to come up with models. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. You've answered the next couple of questions, which is fantastic. So I'm just sure. going to move on to a last couple, which is in your experience of change management, uh, both consulting, being part of it, and leading it. What were the, let's say, the top three lessons that you took away? Um, you can never do enough communication. Okay. Good. Uh, just because you've said something once doesn't mean you have any entitlement to think that people have heard and understood what you said yeah. um, so you need to find lots of ways of, of getting your message out there uh, and you can never listen enough so you need to be out listening walking the floor uh, being open to what people have to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think as a CEO being aware that People might not tell you everything that they their innermost thoughts. So as a, <laughs> the more senior you are, the more you need to recognise uh, that you're in a bit of a bubble. And again, that's where HR can be really helpful. Yeah. I relied enormously on my HR team to be trying to find out what was really going on and what people really thought. Um, but also, you know. You, you naturally in, in your work life will be closer to some people more than others that you for whatever reason your kids go to the same school or whatever yeah. within a business so finding people who you think can actually tell you the truth yeah. but but know that you know you're only ever listening to people's perceptions there's no absolute truth and you just need to keep keep being as open as you possibly can to to knowing what's got you know, trying to find out what people are feeling um and and try not to be surprised at how people are taking things so i think your question was about you know surprises and lessons and for me i just never fail to be surprised at wow i hadn't seen that coming i hadn't seen that this would be upsetting for you um and i'm really glad you told me because now let's figure out what we can do about that i like that, that idea of the ceo being in a bubble of course um course reminds me of uh who's the waitrose chef okay. heston blumenthal that's it oh okay Less, it left me for a moment he was doing a program with uh, little chef and created an oyster pie and was surprised that the little chef diners didn't eat it and he and he came away and said i must live in a gastronomic bubble really mm. <laughs> thank you to oyster pie for the little chef it never worked um, let me just ask you one last question. So let's say I'm a HR manager. I've heard some of what you said here. I've understood some of it. I might go back to my business and think, hmm, we could be in any one of these three bubbles. Yeah. I don't know which one we're in. What would I look for? Right. Um, do you mean within the stages of change? Um, okay, so if you think about, yeah, I guess it's what you're, what are you hearing? So if people are in that kind of ending, letting go phase, or they're stuck there, it may be about a change that actually happened a year ago. Yep. The sorts of things you might see is people keep talking about the good old days in some form or another. 
Good old days, yeah, lovely. Okay. Yeah, so so that can represent itself. I heard of one company that you know years after they'd uh, been acquired or done a rebrand, everyone was still preciously holding on to their old mugs that had the old logo <laughs> on it, which I thought was very emblematic. Um, but but the but talk of the good old days suggests that people haven't let go of some of that stuff, and that can be a good reason to open it up and say so you know what do you miss from that time how can we recreate it now or is it something that really we shouldn't miss we're just looking at it with rose tinted glasses brilliant that's that's good i like that i can see some of our hr managers doing some of that okay brilliant yeah yeah fantastic and then we go into the neutral so, zone don't we is that right so in the neutral zone that's where you will get people being quite um questioning so so saying well i i, I I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, or I, uh, I, I, I know I'm meant to change this process, but the new process doesn't work. So I'm just kind of tinkering with the old one. Um, people get can get quite sort of suspicious during the neutral zone period. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And, and untrusting. Okay. Okay. Untrusting, questioning, yep. Yeah, lots of questioning and untrusting stuff. You know, they say this, but what do they really mean? Kind of scepticism. Lots of people looking at you sideways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and lots of that kind of, yeah, suspicion. Okay. Kind of stuff. And then we move into our last bubble. You yeah, no, if you're in the last bubble, you haven't got any troubles. So, <laughs> so that would be, is if... People are moving forward with lots of energy and purpose and all seem to be engaged behind the vision with no questions about it, no, um, no need for further clarification, uh, comfortable that they know, you know when they what they have authority for and when they need to uh, you know, flag things to somebody else. Um, they're never harking about the past, they're completely forward looking, then you're in the new beginning. Um, so that's the sort of yeah the absence of symptoms brilliant brilliant I think that's a really good description of each of those I could see just going back into my past me and my colleagues going through all three of those stages uh, and I'm seeing it across the uh, the trading floor that I was on brilliant. yeah brilliant. thank you um, just that all-encompassing question anything else you'd like to share with HR managers thinking about change management we've covered an awful lot of great stuff uh, anything else you'd like to share? Um, no, I think it's for HR managers. Yeah, knowing that it's change management is a thing. It's a thing they probably do in some shape or form already, and have probably always been doing. Yeah. Um, it's not. Uh, in some ways, it's not rocket science, but it is something that if you don't pay attention to these things along the way, they will trip you up. Um, and you know. I guess it's trying to find where you can get that support from. So whether that's mutual support from each other within the HR team or from your opposite number in a different organization who maybe has done something similar. Yeah. Obviously there are always consultants out there who are wanting to help you, um, but you need to decide whether that's what you need. Uh, but try and find somebody, as I say, in your peer group, whether that's within your organization or in a, a different organization um, who can help you sort of get hints and tips on what they've found has worked. And also you mentioned the resource, was it Managing Transitions book by William yes, Bridges? Yes, William yeah. Bridges. Okay, we'll, we'll put a link to that. And of course, there's yourself. If they need help, they can come and ask. Of course, of course. <laughs> I'm sure after your garden leave, you're open to some consultancy. Well, as I said to you earlier, you know, if I can help people manage change so that it's not, there's not so much collateral damage for the people along the way, that's what I'd love to be able to do. Brilliant. All right. I'm just going to uh, bring it to an end and then uh, we'll chat afterwards just so we can uh, sure. get into the video. So, Penny, thank you very much for your time. You've given us 45 minutes of wonderful uh, information, knowledge, experience on change management. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.